chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 36, while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they, had, that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. And John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, tonight we look at the fifth appearance, post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. It is... Now, Sunday evening. So, the first four, as well as this fifth appearance of Jesus, all occur on Sunday. It's Sunday evening. The apostles are gathered together for the evening meal. And we read that in Mark 16, 14, and also Luke 24, 35. The apostles have just heard the report of the Emmaus Road disciples 
that they have seen Jesus alive. So remember when those two Emmaus Road disciples saw Jesus and recognized it was him in Emmaus, they immediately returned to Jerusalem and reported it to the apostles. So they have just finished uh, that report and Luke 24, 35 describes it. Uh, they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. And verse 36, while they were telling these things. So they're just finishing their report and Jesus comes in their midst. We'll come to that. Before we do, let's recognize the apostles are still in Jerusalem. John chapter 20 verse 19 tells us that they are. They've locked themselves into a house, and we don't know for sure, but it's not unreasonable to assume that that is the upper room where they celebrated the Passover Seder uh, several nights ago. So they've locked themselves in, John chapter 20 verse 19 says that that is because they feared the Jewish authorities. They were afraid. So in this season for us, we might be reminded that on the very first Easter the apostles put themselves on lockdown. <laughs> they quarantined themselves. And why did they do it? They were afraid. They were afraid. So they do that. An interesting question. Was Peter there yet? Now, eventually he is because it refers to the 11. So Peter must have gotten there at some point. But remember in uh, Luke 24, verse 34, we looked at this last time. Sometime between when the Emmaus Road disciples saw Jesus... And when they got to Jerusalem, Jesus appeared to Peter. And so I'm assuming that Peter was probably not in the room yet. And if he had been, wouldn't Peter have run into the room and said, hey, I just saw Jesus. And we don't have any record of that in the text. So I'm going to assume that he wasn't there yet, although we're not told uh, one way or the other about this. But the apostles are locked up in Jerusalem and keep in mind now, they have been told three times that they are supposed to go where? Galilee. And here they are. It's Sunday evening. They have had all day to get started in leaving town 
knowing that on the third day Jesus would rise from the dead and meet them in Galilee. And they've had all day and multiple warnings. And where are they? They're still in Jerusalem, which is an indication of unbelief in relationship to the resurrection of Jesus. So they have failed to go to Galilee. So, at this point, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Luke 24, verse 36, as well as John 20, verse 19. Now, keep in mind, the door is locked. They locked the door so nobody could get in for their own protection. They locked themselves in. The door is locked. And now, instantaneously, Jesus is standing in their midst. He didn't knock at the door. He didn't do some climb through a window or something. He was just there in their midst. He came from his glorified dimension into their dimension so that they could see him. It was an amazing thing. And Jesus said, peace be with you. So you can understand why they were startled. Luke 24 verse 37 says they were. They saw him, and even though they saw him with their own eyes, they still could not grasp that he had been bodily resurrected. Now, how do we know that? Their first thought was what? We're seeing a ghost. We're seeing a spirit. By the way, there's are forms of Jewish mysticism even today that uh, focus on ghosts and other things. I just saw this last week concerning Passover that there were supposedly ghosts hanging out at the uh, mikvahs, the, ver the uh, washing areas. We would call them baptistries uh, outside the temple. And they were there to help people uh, get baptized uh, in there. And all kinds of reports going on about, hey, people are seeing ghosts in Jerusalem. And that was just this past week. So uh, they thought they saw a ghost. And at this point, Mark 16, 14 tells us that Jesus rebuked them. And we have to picture this as being a very loving rebuke. Uh, so I've said he lovingly scolded them but he scolded them for their unbelief. Their unbelief had been manifested in three ways. And we now have seen these. The first way, they failed 
to leave for Galilee. Well, why did they fail to leave for Galilee? They didn't really believe that Jesus was risen. So, unbelief. The second way it was manifest, they did not believe the witnesses. Did they believe Mary Magdalene when she came and told them? No. Did they believe the other women? No. Did they believe the Emmaus Road disciples? No. They didn't believe the witnesses. And Mark 16, 14 says that Jesus scolded them for not believing these witnesses. And now they manifest unbelief because they think he is a ghost or a spirit. So he has to tell them about their unbelief. Now, if this appearance had ended right there, Jesus said, okay, I'm here, I appeared, and you guys have a problem because you don't believe. If that's where this had ended, it wouldn't be a very helpful account, would it? At least to us. It doesn't end there. Jesus proved to them that he is bodily resurrected. He proved it to them. Well, how did he prove it to them? He showed them his wounds. He showed them his hands and his side. John chapter 20, verse 20. He showed them his hands, his side. He let them see these wounds in my body. Say, come on, guys. These are the wounds, the spear that was in my side, the nails in my hands on the cross. You can see them. They are still here. He showed them his wounds. He invited them to touch him. Luke 24, 39. He actually said to all of them that they could touch his wounds, touch his side. Now, if he was a ghost and they would have reached out to touch him, what would have happened? They wouldn't have felt anything, would they? So this becomes a proof of his resurrection. And then in Luke 20, verses 40 through 43 that we read, he ate some broiled fish. So he ate, and what does it look like for ghosts to eat fish? Anybody know? No, nobody knows because that doesn't happen. So he is in a resurrected physical body. He is bodily resurrected. He bears the wounds. He can be touched and he can eat fish. This to us is a reminder that even in Jesus' resurrected, glorified body, he maintained evidence of the wounds that he experienced in his death on the cross. In his hands, 
in his side. There was evidence of that. Years ago, I had a man come up to me. Uh, it was actually when I was on a lunch break from work. This guy came up to me and he said, Hi, I'm Jesus Christ. And uh, introduced himself to me as Jesus. And we spoke for a few minutes. I asked him about some prophecies in the Bible that he didn't know anything about. And then finally I said, uh, I said, I would like to see your hands and I'd like you to lift up your shirt so I can see your side. And he just looked at me funny like, why would you do that? I said, if you are Jesus Christ, you will have evidence of those wounds in your body. And he just went, oh, I don't, you know, he didn't know what I was talking about. I said, well, that is proof that you are not Jesus Christ. And it's proof that you need Jesus Christ. And we talked about the gospel. He didn't believe me, and I'm not sure that he had... Uh, all the fries in his Happy Meal, but uh, he nonetheless thought he was Jesus. So Jesus proved to them that he was bodily resurrected. Then Jesus gave the apostles the first set of three great commission statements. John chapter 20 verses 21 through 23. In John chapter 20 verse 21 there is the statement of apostolic proclamation authority. Jesus said to them as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So, the apostles were sent by Jesus with the same authority as Jesus was sent by the Father. That was the authority of the apostles. When Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I also send you, that is not directly to subsequent generations of the church, like us. That was for the apostles. Now that doesn't mean that we don't share in that authority as well, but it's much more indirect for us. And this was very direct to them. So the Father sent me, I also send you. The apostles had the authority of Jesus when they were speaking so if an apostle would speak to you and you disregarded it, you were disregarding Jesus. That's how much authority the apostles had. If you obeyed them, then you were obeying Jesus. If you disregarded them, you were disregarding Jesus. They were sent with Jesus' authority. And the whole book of Acts begins to bear that out, doesn't it? When you read the book of Acts. Then in John chapter 20, verse 22, 
There's apostolic illumination authority. Jesus breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And it's very interesting that the word for spirit and the word for breathed are the same word. He breathed on them. We could say he spirited on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this was the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus made to the apostles that they would receive the Holy Spirit for a particular purpose. So this, when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit to them, he is not talking about what you and I would call the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He is talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had promised. You can recall it from John chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. Here's what Jesus had said to them. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he, the Holy Spirit, will guide you, the apostles, into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. So what was the Holy Spirit's ministry to the apostles? It was to disclose to them truth. To disclose to them what God the Father was saying to God the Son. And the Holy Spirit would reveal that to the apostles. For what purpose? You're holding it in your hand. For the purpose that you would have the New Testament that was written by apostles or in the case of some letters not written by apostles, authorized by apostles, and the Holy Spirit's ministry was to make sure that the apostles had the right words to write, including about things to come, Jesus said. Prophecy. And so you have prophecy throughout the New Testament that teaches about things to come. That was all the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. So the Great Commission begins with their authority to proclaim truth, their authority to write down and record the revealed truth from the Holy Spirit, 
And then in John chapter 20, verse 23, there is apostolic disciplinary authority where Jesus gave them the authority to forgive sins or to retain sins, to loose or to bind. Now, you might recall Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, that authority had already been given to Peter, correct? Peter was given that authority. Whatever you bind shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose shall have been loosed in heaven. Now that same authority is given to the other ten apostles. So that the apostles have this disciplinary authority for the purpose of the establishment of the church. And so the apostles, and by that I mean the 11, what we sometimes call capital A apostles, uh, not small a apostles like we would use with the word missionary today, but uh, capital A apostles, they had authority to proclaim Jesus, to write the New Testament under the illumination of the Holy Spirit, and to lead the church in church discipline. Well, now, John chapter 20, verse 24, we are informed that out of the 11, I guess sometime in there, maybe Peter has arrived, but somebody left. And the somebody who left, left before Jesus had appeared. And that somebody was Thomas, John 20, 24. He was not with them when Jesus came. And in John chapter 20, verse 25, Thomas refused. He refused to believe in Jesus' resurrection unless he could see and touch the Lord for himself. Unless I see him, unless I put my hands into the imprint of the nails and my finger into the imprint of the nails, I won't believe. So Thomas wouldn't take their word for it. He's persisting in unbelief, as they had been as well. Uh, and he refused to believe. And as we'll get to it next time, Thomas continued in his unbelief for over a week. For over a week. He continued in his unbelief. We'll close tonight with this thought. Why didn't the others, so apparently now there are ten who have seen Jesus resurrected, why didn't they go, we better immediately get to Galilee. Wasn't that what they were supposed to do? Why didn't they do that? A week later, they're still in Jerusalem. Why didn't they? Evidently, we're not told exactly why, but evidently, 
They were waiting for Thomas, who was one of the group. So they don't go to Galilee until after Thomas is convinced. Which tells us that the apostles had a strong sense this had been taught to them by Jesus for several years. They had a strong sense that they belonged together. As in, if Thomas isn't going, we're not going either. They were not like the average American who would say, well, I'm going to Galilee, you know, too bad for you. They disobeyed together, but they also wanted to obey together. And so they waited for Thomas. And so that's an interesting lesson in these days. Heavenly Father, as we go to prayer now, we thank you for these post-resurrection appearances of our Savior. And uh, Lord, may the real sense of Jesus, knowing that Jesus indwells us tonight by his Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus at your right hand, Father, is interceding for us, knowing that Jesus is alive. May that, even as we pray tonight, even as we trust you day by day through this time of exile, Lord, I pray that you will strengthen your people, bring us through it, and Lord, may your people day by day live in confidence in you. And may you continue to provide for us individually and as a church. All to the praise of your glory. Now, Lord, uh, may your people uh, join together in prayer. Uh, here in this room, maybe in homes tonight, Maybe some people would call each other on the phone and have prayer together over the phone. Uh, whatever it would take, Lord, for your people, for your church to engage together in prayer. And Lord, may it be a beautiful time before you. In Jesus' name, amen.